The first thing I'd like to raise is that I think Sharia law is a reflection of the strength of the political Islamic movement. So wherever you see that movement vying for power, you see a rise in, for example, informal Sharia courts and councils in a place like Britain or Canada. And where it has power, like in Iran or Saudi Arabia, Sharia law then becomes the law of the land. And I think this is an important point because very often Sharia law is promoted as the, the desire of, of people, that this is something people want, that Sharia law is something that people are demanding. Very often the Islamists in Britain, for example, they'll say, look, there are all these women coming to these courts, so this is a desire of women in particular. And I mean, I think it's, it's quite, if you think about it, why would people want something that gives them less rights? where their testimony would be worth half that of a man's, that they wouldn't have full right to child custody, for example. Under Sharia, a child has to be given to the father at a preset age, irrespective of the welfare and the needs of the child. Or even in a marriage contract, for example, a guardian for the woman needs to sign the marriage contract. And divorce is very limited for women. Uh, for example, men have the right to divorce unilaterally by saying talaq, divorce three times, and that option is not available for women, and so on and so forth. So I think oftentimes, um, if, if you look in, in Britain, for example, women who are accessing Sharia courts are some of the most disenfranchised and vulnerable in British society. And in a sense, they need secular law and the, the, the equal rights that have been fought for by, by progressive social movements more than anybody else. And they're often railroaded into going into these Sharia courts. And there's quite a lot of examples of, of, of the fact that it's not really voluntary, even though it's promoted as such. For example, um, women who've, uh, they, they did a study of women who were going to these courts. And they found that out of 10 cases this one study looked at, Four of the women had orders of protection by the police because their husbands were so violent. And the husband was using these Sharia courts to then renegotiate child custody and uh, his relationship with his wife. So in, in that sense, it's, it's very often you see that women are actually railroaded into using these courts and are denied the rights that are due them and that they deserve. So I suppose the first point I want to raise is that it's, it's, it's very much linked to a political movement that is reactionary, that is inhuman, that's misogynist, that's homophobic. And that very often, when it, 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 it's at the expense of people's lives and rights that it gets hold, and not the other way around. It's very often not necessarily people's beliefs. You know, the fact that one believes in Islam even, or is a Muslim, is not the same as wanting a Sharia court. There are a lot of Christians, for example, living in Canada. They don't want to live under canon law. And I think the problem is that the political Islamic movement often feigns to represent millions and millions of billions of people who they say are Muslims. Um, and, and it always seems that they're the most reactionary type, which is the Islamist. And I think, as, as you mentioned um, in, in the earlier talk, is that there is a huge distinction between Muslims and Islamists, and I think that that's an important distinction to remember. You know, <clears throat> when they talk about the fact that uh, issues of civil matters like marriage, child custody, divorce, you know, oftentimes when they want to bring Sharia in the West, they talk about those as being mundane matters. They're not really important. They say, hold on, we, we don't want to start stoning people in the middle of, of, of city squares and centers. And my point is that it's really a matter of degree because the fundamentals are the same. The, the inequality and misogyny of, of Sharia law um, is, is very much, you, you can see it reflected in divorce and child custody laws and marriage laws as well as when it comes to stoning, for example. You know, it's, it's a question of degree. So in Iran, they even specify the size of the stone that should be used in stonings. Uh, it shouldn't be too small so that it takes too long. It shouldn't be too large to cause immediate death. And uh, it should just, they even specify the right size of the stone. And in Britain, they have, you know, the more mundane aspects. But the point I always try to raise is many of the, the women who fled from 
countries under Islamic rules have fled these very laws uh, and, and they're now being railroaded into using them again and, um, uh, as, as their choice and what they deserve because they're you know, part of a Muslim community. Um, and in a sense, I mean, it, it was referred to earlier as well, the whole issue of this Muslim community there are so many people within any community. There are atheists, socialists, secularists, free thinkers, and so on and so forth, as there are in Canada, for example. And, you know, you often think, well, whose culture are they talking about? You know, in northern Iraq, um, a group, a, a, a very large group of men stoned Doha Khalil to death. I don't know if you've seen the video on YouTube. And, you know, her, her parents were against her stoning and they were opposed to it. And Doa herself was obviously not for the stoning. She, she tried to stand <laughs> until the very last moment. And the boy she fell in love with was also obviously not for the stoning. So, you know, the, the question is who, whose culture and whose belief um, are we talking about and imposing on masses of people that often are the first victims of Sharia law and also at the forefront of resisting this law and political Islam as well. The other interesting thing is the fact that it's always, you know, um, that when, when they talk about Sharia law, it's, I think, Islamists and Western government policy is such that they use rights language and anti-racist language to justify Sharia law. So it's a question of we need Sharia courts in Canada or Britain, for example, because it defends minority rights. Um, you know, and because people have different beliefs, they need different sets of laws. Well, I mean, in fact, in a plural society, you have to have one law and one secular law in order to ensure that people have equal rights. And, you know, I think what's happened is that everything's become upside down to a large extent. You have um, initially concepts such as rights, equality, respect. These were concepts that were raised vis-a-vis -vis human beings, individuals not vis-a-vis -vis religions and beliefs. And now what's happened is that religions and beliefs are, have to be respected, respected and be treated equally, irrespective of the damage and the harm it's causing to real life human beings. So, and I think cultural relativism has had a big role to play in this. You know, oftentimes you hear, well, universal rights, they're Western concepts. They, they don't belong to everybody. And I always find that interesting because, you know, the Mullah, in, the, the Islamic regime in Iran is trying to get nuclear technology and use the latest technology to, to repress and oppress people in the working class. And yet when it comes to rights, and especially women's rights, suddenly they become Western concepts and they're not applicable to huge numbers of people. Um, you know, the other issue is very often um, we, we hear that opposing Sharia law or standing up to criticizing Islam or the political Islamic movement is seen to be a form of racism. And again, it's the whole, the way that the distinctions have been blurred so that now you can actually defame religion uh, as, as mandated now by the UN Human Rights Council. And you can be you can commit libel against religion, whereas in fact, libel, defamation, these are concepts that were again raised to protect human beings, not religions and beliefs. And I think it's all part of a concerted effort by the political Islamic movement and by Western governments to limit freedom of expression and to appease this movement, because I think in the end, Western governments don't really have a problem with political Islam. They have a problem with what they label nowadays extremism which means we don't want you to bomb you know, undergrounds and buses in London or bomb buildings in, in New York, which is outrageous and huge human tragedies. Um, but it's okay for you to have Sharia law in Iran, in Iraq, in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So for example, you see uh, in this war on terror, Iraq has become more Islamic than it was in the past. And Afghanistan is, is an Islamic state. And if, you've, if you Google um, just Sharia law in just this past few days, you see, for example, that the British government is actually setting up 
Sharia courts in Afghanistan, as if it's not enough that they already have Sharia law as the law of the land in Afghanistan. 